Hi there everyone from Scotland. We are at St Cecilia's Hall, which is the University of Edinburgh's Museum of Musical Instruments. If you're ever here in Edinburgh, make sure you come and visit. There's all sorts of incredible things on display. They have something like 6,000 objects. About 500 of them are actually on display and you can come in and have a look, check them out. But today, the curator, Dr Jenny Nex, has chosen three musical instruments that have a bit of a science bent to them, is that fair to say? Yes, I would say so. I mean, all music is dealing with acoustics, of course, so fundamentally musicians are doing applied physics. Um, but they don't tell us that when we're playing music because it would frighten a lot of people. <laughs> OK. I'm very excited about all three of these. This first one blows my mind. It's the coolest looking musical instrument I've ever seen. Yeah, this is what we call a stroh fiddle or a stroh violin. It was invented by Augustus Stroh, who was an engineer. He was interested in early recording technologies. So he's basically used the same technologies that were being developed for recording music in a musical instrument. So it's pretty much works like a normal violin. You have the four strings and you bow them or pluck them as you would a regular violin. But instead of the resonator being a, a wooden box with air inside, we've got a diaphragm inside this disc here. So the vibrations travel from the strings through the bridge and into the diaphragm and then they come out through the horn. Can we pick it up? Can we have a better look at it? These do. Oh, I can pick it up. You can, can if you like. <laughs> I think this is probably the first time I've ever held a violin of any sort. So in a normal violin, you would be playing on the strings and what the sound would go through the bridge, yes. this thing here, into the big wooden box. Exactly. But instead, it's going from the bridge into this disc, this diaphragm, That's and then right. blowing out the horn. What about this though, this second horn? Well, they found that when violinists played this, because the sound was projecting out of the large horn, they couldn't really hear what they were doing very well. So they added a little side horn that you can point at your ear and hear better what you're playing. They were a bit of a fad. You get uh, one string versions being a lot in music hall, um, which is quite fun. Uh, and they were adopted in jazz and folk traditions. Uh, so you might see them. There's a busker in Edinburgh I sometimes see with, with one. Um, and they're also used quite a lot in the folk music of Transylvania. Uh, well, I knew that. I'm a big fan of Transylvanian <laughs> folk music, so... That, there's some fantastic <laughs> players out there. Now, you have all sorts of bizarre instruments here, and you must see visitors come and react to them. How do people react to this one? This must be one that people go, what's going on there? Exactly. It's, it looks different from what we're expecting. It, it kind of looks like a cross between a trumpet and a violin, um, and it, it is quite fun. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Come on, Brady, let's hear some of that Transylvanian folk music. Unfortunately, my contract doesn't allow me to play here on Objectivity, but Jenny has agreed to maybe give it a bash for us. I won't be playing Transylvania folk music, though. You got it then? I'll All have right. It. If you had your eyes closed, would you be able to tell the difference? I think so, yes. It's got a little bit more of a kind of slightly metallic zing to it. Um, it's also very different to, to hold because the weight is kind of going backwards a bit. So you have to get used to the different balance of it. It's close, but not the same. Okay. Which is probably why people, uh, when the recording technologies moved on, they then went back to their normal violins. Um, and then this, in certain contexts, is confined to the museum. Um, but it's an interesting part of history, I think. Jenny mentioned that a normal violin will amplify the music using this wooden box. We have another violin here and yet again you're not giving us the wooden box. <laughs> What's happened here? Can I, can I show people this yes, one? Yes, please do. This is mid-19th century probably. It looks much newer though. It looks a bit like an electric violin that's not got its electrics plugged in. This instrument was one of the objects that were acquired by Professor John Donaldson, who was the Reed Professor of Music here from 1845. He had a really holistic approach to music teaching. He thought that musicians, yes, they need to be able to play an instrument, but they should also know about music history, about theory, oral, and something about acoustics. So as well as collecting musical instruments from lots of different cultures around the world, he also uh, collected and had made uh, objects that would demonstrate how the acoustics of instruments work. There are a number of things we have in the collection where an important part has been left out. 
so we can demonstrate what that part does. And here it's the resonating box, so the, the wood resonance and the air resonance inside uh, that this instrument does not have. I can imagine violinists sitting in lessons going, oh, I wonder what a violin would sound like without the box. And you can pull this out and go, well, let me show you. And let us show you right now. <laughs> Here we go. It sounds like you're like playing down the bottom of a mine shaft or something. <laughs> yeah, very long way away. But it's absolutely ideal if you want to practice at midnight. Nobody's going to hear you. So it's got kind of modern practical applications as well as what Donaldson had it uh, made for. All right, now we have one more object to show you. It's a little bit too heavy to bring down here. So we're going to go upstairs for this one. All right, so we've come upstairs now and we have what well, appears to be a piano and a very old piano. Yes, this dates from 1793. So it's at the period when the piano was really becoming popular and we see the harpsichord falling out of favour. It was made in London by John Broadwood and Company. John Broadwood, I'm contractually obliged to say, was actually Scottish. Uh, so we have to promote him uh, as one of our own. And he, uh, first of all, uh, probably learnt woodworking with his father. His father was a carpenter. Uh, and then he went down to London and started working for the harpsichord maker Burkett. At Shudi. Um, he ended up marrying Shudi's daughter and took over the firm uh, when Shudi uh, retired. So they were based in Great Pulteney Street. There's a little address on the front here. It says Johannes Broadwood Londini Fake It 1793. So they like doing it in Latin, it sounds posher. Great Pulteney Street, Golden Square. So right in the heart of London. What's the difference between a harpsichord and a piano? It's the action inside. The instrument right behind you is a 1793 instrument by Broadwood. So it's exactly the same date, the same company, but this is a harpsichord. And if you play a note, you'll hear it's quite different. Oh yeah, this is like in the movies. Yeah, when they're We're doing... We're plucking the strings in here, whereas in a piano, you're hitting the strings. So are you ready, people? Here's a pluck. And now here's a hit. Nearly the same note as well. <laughs> well, you know, I know my notes. <laughs> I got no idea. Now, you chose this piano specifically because you know I'm a bit of a science fan and there's something a little bit sciencey and mathematical to this one. Yes, I mean, musical instrument makers are, are all dealing with the acoustics of how whatever they're working with operates. And some of them do it instinctively, some of them do it because they make the instrument that way, that's the way they've been taught to do it. But other people actually seek scientists to work with them uh, and really think about what they're doing and analyse it. Um, one of the issues with pianos is that the strings are in themselves out of tune, kind of within their own vibrations. So what they wanted to do was to enhance the parts of the sound that conform most closely to a harmonic series, which is what our ears like, and to reduce the impact of any parts of it that are out of tune from that. They did all the maths, which thankfully I don't have to do, um, and worked out that they should be hitting the string about a ninth of the distance along to make it sound as in tune as they can. So John Broadwood worked with Edward Whittaker Gray uh, to do this, uh, and they came up with the, the results, and that's kind of how the piano is then designed uh, and, and built. Can we have so, a look at that spot? Yes, let me just move the music desk oh, yeah. out of the way All right. so we can see inside a bit oh, better. Look at that, look at that. That could have been built yesterday. It's so, it looks fantastic. So the hammers pop up in there. So this instrument has got three strings for each note and we've got the right pedal, which raises the dampers. So when I play the note, it sustains it. The left pedal is the una corda. How's your Italian? Not that good. <laughs> una corda means one string. So if you watch the keyboard, everything moves. The whole keyboard and the hammers, the whole action shifts slightly so that instead of hitting three strings, you're hitting one. So it's a slightly softer sound. Did this research that was done back then and this finding of the one ninth magic sweet spot then become the norm and all pianos copied it or, do, or are all pianos different where that strike happens? 
I think they're all aiming it around about 10% along the length of the string. Um, but any musical instrument, you're, you're having to make compromises um, between the ideal acoustics and something that's practical and what individual makers like a slightly different sound quality. So it is still the ideal, but there's always a bit of wriggle room within the instruments. Well, thank you so much for showing us all these instruments today. Can I, can I play us out? Go on then. That doesn't sound right. Silent night. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's gorgeous. This is amazing. This is his gold medal from the Paris Olympics, 1924. Look at that. That's the real deal. I cannot believe I'm touching this. And it even has written on the edge here. The time that he ran, 400 metres, won by E.H. Little, time 47 and 3 fifths of a second. Firstly, can I say, it doesn't look very gold. <laughs> that was one of the things that um, we always check with the medals, which are, and it's, it's handy having that on, on the side because it, it looks like a silver medal.